start with our first question? Well, just we're supposed to introduce ourselves and say where we're going. Go ahead, Tom. I'm Tom Atley from Mormon Street Co-op, which is a uh, um, little, it's little compared to some of these other folks' operations. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a, um, east, of, east of campus uh, near Hendricks Park. Uh, it's a duplex which has this wall broken down between two parts. We have one house with two kitchens, two dining rooms, two basements, two everything. Uh, and we have about 10 people, give or take, uh, living there. And it's been existing as a functional co-op since 2000 and as a legal co-op since 2003. And we are a consensus household, but we are closer to a sort of co-sensing household. We have, we have process that sort of changes all the time, and we don't have things really well nailed down at any given time. But it's really, oh, we have our moderator coming. <laughs> we just heard what we're talking about. Uh, yeah, and I've been there uh, since 2001, and I'm part of the board, and that's a quickie. Description. I'm Robert Bowman. I'm the I'm the, uh, the totally cool eco landlord at Maitreya Eco Village. Uh, it's about ten dwelling units characterized by uh, a number of environmentally innovative houses that I've built over the years, um, and uh, the, the ownership has expanded. There's uh, other people have bought property or are renting property nearby that are part of us, but, but, but at the end of the day, it's a kind of a glorified landlord-tenant situation until it stops being that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and how many people did you say? How many oh, people? about 10 dwelling units and about 30 people. I'll look at it in an accurate count. It's like mm -hmm. <laughs> counting cats or something. <laughs> Measuring the water over Niagara Falls. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm Joanne Fox. I live in Portland, Oregon, in uh, a, an urban co-housing community that's for active seniors, for 55 and older, and we have been together for two years now, um, living together. Um, we have 27 individual condos, each has its own kitchen, fully functional, small condo, but then we have 5,000 square feet of common space that we share. And um, I'm also involved with the um, Oakley Meadow group because I am uh, I am uh, wanting to live in an intergenerational community instead of senior only community. But I'm also con um, looking at one that's forming in Hood River. So co-housing is great, but it's very expensive. <laughs> It's very expensive to build. And, um, What's the name of the community you're in now? PDX Commons, and it's um, <coughs> it's uh, Belmont and 43rd, so it's um, close to downtown, but not exactly downtown. So My I, name is. I kind of showed up yeah. a little bit late. Yeah. Have you have you spoken, Skeeter? No. Okay, yet. your turn. Yeah. Um, yeah, my name is Skeeter Duke. I live at the East Blair Housing Co-op, um, which is in the Whitaker neighborhood near Fourth and Adams. In the late 1970s, Jimmy Carter was in office and he had the National Center for Appropriate Technology. They issued a prize to any neighborhood in the United States that came up with a really long-term, visionary, uh, uh, sustainable, Plan. We in the Whitaker neighborhood, folks organized, they applied for it, they focused on uh, urban food uh, growing, uh, an urban farm came out of that at the U of O, and also preventative health on the neighborhood level. And then the third component was to create a low income housing cooperative, and we won out of nationwide competition, a half a million dollars. Wow. And, wow. That's a lot um, of money then. <laughs> uh, yeah, and a bunch of my anti-nuclear friends and other neighborhood activists organized the third part component and created our housing co-op. 
We applied for uh, a loan uh, from the National Co-op Bank of a half a million dollars, and that came in officially, uh, our, the co-op officially started in February of 1982. And I had to wait till my dog died uh, in 1984, because at that point we had a pet policy that didn't allow dogs. Anyway, I, that, I've been living there since 1984, so it's, this is my 35th year of living there. It's an amazing place. We have owned 22 households for the last many years on five city lots, all fairly much contiguous in near 4th and Adams. About a year ago, we bought this other house. It's about five bedrooms right next to mine. So now we have two very large clusters with common space. So basically, we have an ever-evolving group of people who most of them come in as having been renters, and they quickly become owners because when you move in there, you're part of the whole movie, and you're obligated to participate in standing committees, housing grounds, management and maintenance, uh, and um, membership. And we all have our tasks and our duties, and we have budgets that we can spend money. If we have a quorum of four members each week for our meeting, we've got thousands of dollars that members just have researched, recommended, and oftentimes just make those quick decisions right on the, on the committee level. And we use consensus minus one as our decision-making system. And all of us are board members, sure. All of us are board members and we once a month or more if necessary get together as a general membership to make uh, policy decisions, new members, hire staff, uh, money, big, you know, all the stuff. We run the show. And it's never boring. Uh, some people have been there 15, 20 years. It's a lot less contentious than it used to be. Personally, I don't think we can do enough networking. We're always reinventing the wheel. And uh, we have openings coming up again soon, so there's a little, a little form out there if people want to fill that out. There you go. Okay. Uh, sorry for coming in a little bit late. For the next kind of a question, and we know this is a fishbowl, you know, or this is sort of like a interview of, of the fishbowl participants. We may or may not have time, you know. You can certainly talk with, with any of the fishbowl participants later, but we kind of want to have a little bit of a focused. And this was the first part, was just to kind of introduce and, and where are you from and, and what's the infrastructure. So the next question, is, is sort of a, a make-believe scenario. Let's just kind of pretend that this is the year 2025 and the kind of things that, that a lot of us started are thinking are gonna happen, you know, with a, with a downslope are actually happening, you know. It's not like chaos, but unemployment's gone up to say 20%. And uh, there are a lot of people who are uh, finding out that having uh, missing their weekly paycheck, you know, there's a lot of uh, insecurity. A lot of people are saying, wow, I remember these people met at the, uh, the River Road Rec Center and talked about this stuff, and now it's actually happening. You know what I mean? So say that the four of you, with your experience, in cooperative living, and these are different places too, you know, they are way different systems, but what does your experience have to offer other people, say these are people who have come to this event and they want to learn how to, how to live cooperatively too, you know, what's the process, how do you deal with personalities, what have you four people learned that you would tell these people in this hypothetical situation, here's what we've learned, you know, in, in our experience, and this may be helpful for you, for you to set up a cooperative and be as successful as you can, because in this future scenario, people can't afford to live by themselves anymore. They gotta, they gotta cooperate and share and look out for each other. Does that make sense? Okay, anybody wanna start? 
I'm going to think about it for a second. So, and, and just go for a few minutes, and then maybe we'll get into some dialogue. But just be conscious, you know, everybody want to have a chance. We've got about 25 minutes. Well, I'll start. Okay, Rob. You've specifically told me not to go off on a rant, so I don't know what to, what to say. But uh, We all have our opinions. <laughs> well, I, I, I started doing the, the my trade village formed based on the fact that I glommed on to green building as an activist cause. I started doing all this really cool natural building and stuff. And, and uh, uh, But the more I looked at the idea of sustainability, the more I started to realize with a big gulp just how difficult it's going to be to achieve genuine, meaningful sustainability as distinct from sustainability. Uh, and and, and uh, our, it's going to be so disruptive of the economy that our so-called leaders are just going to keep putting duct tape and chewing gum and crazy glue onto this existing, utterly unsustainable paradigm okay, until so the whole thing falls Okay, so where over. are you going to teach people? What are you going Will to you let me finish? No, okay. okay. So, so, so basically, I'm doing a number of things at my Shreya Eco Village uh, to, I've, I've, it's turned from an, a permaculture demonstration site into a lifeboat. And I have done a number of things to try to, to make it so that we can weather the coming weird times. One thing I'm doing right now is, is building an outdoor kitchen. Yes, it's a quaint idea. We do these canning parties and stuff, but it might also serve to feed a lot of people in the coming weird times. Mm -hmm. I've built a 4,000 gallon uh, rainwater cistern uh, utterly unsustainable out of a steel culvert and lots of concrete. But I, I went ahead and built it knowing that I want to have some kind of serious rainwater storage, both for uh, uh, irrigation and drinking, but also maybe for fire suppression should the fire department get disrupted. Uh, uh, I, I built a, a, a 15 foot across octagonal shaped meditation sanctuary. I'm one of those people who started meditating back in the 70s when the Beatles got into it and became popular and, and I'm convinced that it's beneficial and I'm convinced that as things begin to unravel uh, there's going to be a greater and greater need for people to just uh, become, to, to achieve a level of peace and tranquility in their lives as they're watching this current thing we take for granted start to fall apart. So, so those are the things I've done. Uh, infrastructure. Infrastructure stuff yeah. in preparation, mm -hmm. yeah. My favorite uh, analogy is you're on the Titanic, it's going down, you're wondering what to do, and then all of a sudden this other ocean liner pulls up right next to you. It's made out of natural, non-toxic materials, and it's solar and wind powered, and there's a really fun dance party on the deck with all this delicious organic food, and everybody looks really vibrant and alive. You know, you're not going to be told that the Titanic is a poor choice in ships. You're going to jump onto the deck of that other ship. So, so that's what this is hoping, hoping to be, that it would be an example. And all of a sudden, you know, all these people would say, oh, let's do what they're doing. They seem to have something going on. So it'll be like an example of, of something that makes slightly more sense. I, I predict a time when there will be hungry hedge fund managers tracking down permaculture people, trying to persuade them to work on their yard. You know, yeah. Is okay. permaculture a big part of your development? We we have a fishbowl. Ah. So we're gonna we're gonna stick with that because we can go off on tangents. Yes. <laughs> I am severe. So, so are you gonna punish no, her again? Yeah, she violated the fishbowl. Yes. You can you can chat up Rob, he's glad to share his thoughts. Then great, thanks Rob. Sure. Okay, who's next? I'll talk. Okay. The only thing that I've learned, we've learned is that being part of a community, it helps people to be more resilient and to um, to feel like somebody's got their back. And because we are a community of older people, I would just say that living cooperatively with your neighbors and knowing that you're that they're friends and that they're there, you know, they can help you out. Uh, just makes people feel more um, supported and healthier. Um, as they age, it keeps their minds more engaged, being you know involved with people on a daily basis. It um, keeps people from being isolated. And the other thing is that having community meals on a regular basis is very important to keep people, um, you know, connected and cooperating with each other. Working together is a wonderful way to you know, become 
gelled as community. And uh, I don't know about the um, economic factors. We are very privileged where I live in my community. It was very expensive and we, you know, we, we couldn't afford to subsidize a low income unit in our community because our prices were just so high, new construction is crazy. Um, so that's what I know. Tom, skater? Did, did people introduce, we know who these people are? Okay, I just see them late, so I don't We know. did. Okay, all the women. Yeah, it's funny, because this, the, the fact that this is so tightly timed and linear to me is one of the things that you can't have in a community uh, to, uh, to actually delve into. Well, the, the situation you've given us involves so much complexity and so much unpredictability that the relationships between the people and whatever uh, tolerance they have for each other, whatever processes they have to actually delve into different insights people have, different concerns people have, uh, to be able to find a way together, unless you have some top-down arrangement and things get chaotic, then having somebody who tells people what to do can be very efficient. Uh, but if you're actually trying to live together in the midst of tremendous uncertainty and challenge, your ability to tolerate all your differences so you don't have to constantly do the work of dealing with them trying to have nice, smooth, happy relationships with everybody uh, is probably not going to happen if you have real, real challenges. Uh, that's my own personal lesson is the primary way to do it, uh, to survive in such things is to be, uh, to tolerate, to be able to have a, a wide range of tolerance rather than a very narrow one where you go out of your tolerance level really quickly. Uh, and to me, the basic thing is the relationships between the people and the extent to which you can establish some kind of agreements of how you're going to operate. Uh, but that takes time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. It's such a beautiful sunny day and it's hard to jump from this into four or five, six years from now. And uh, you know, I think all of us see some dark clouds coming and it makes me nervous. So one of the main things that I thinking of is like emergency preparedness that it would be a good idea I think for all of us to start anticipating the reality not only of uh, uh, climate catastrophe but this whole digital age is so fragile if you've seen that movie gravity uh, you know what I'm talking about and so I think this whole thing could easily collapse stuff we take for granted could suddenly not be there. So I'm thinking we ought to anticipate we're going to need food and water and knowing how to get along and martial arts so we can like defend ourselves. I'm not into guns so like that's a reality. How are we thinking about people going nuts, scared, I-5 shut down. I mean it's like the big one hits uh, but it's a different kind of big one. So at the co-op, we over the years have dug up lots of our parking lots and other driveways and stuff and turned them into gardens and orchards. Um, so I'm thinking, well, let's do that more. And water storage sounds good. First aid kits, learning how to take care of each other. And in the meantime, our co-op is lousy at this. I think we need to network and stop reinventing the wheels, as I was mentioning before, and find out from each other connect up, really get that um, framework a lot more solid, get the bicycles out, you know, be ready, because I think we're, we're looking at some scary times. But we, we're also smart enough, we've got tools. The Titanic is sinking, but we've got carpenters, lots of great women doing it, uh, and tools uh, uh, and wood. We could build our lifeboats. We don't have to wait for that other boat to show up. So anyway that time we can figure it out. So there's two I, I recognize kind of of sort of a couple of primary points made here which of course we don't have enough time to really get into <coughs> extreme detail but something that occurred to me in your conversations is there's a social infrastructure and then there's a built infrastructure. 
So how the question is, and, and, and Skeeter just mentioned like work parties. That's a social action for doing, you know, a practical. So maybe uh, comment on, on the build infrastructure and the social infrastructure and how those, those items are both changing and how they can be sort of channeled in a, in a, in a, uh, a responsible direction as a function of each other. Quilting party, the whatever harvest thing is a lot of in in uh, agricultural indigenous cultures of people who are socializing and making decisions and whether while they're doing something they need to have done physically. Uh, we do a little bit of that at Walnut Street, but I can imagine there being a lot more of that. And we had some people from Africa once come to visit us. We had. Uh, well, they asked us how many people were in the house. We said around 10. They said, wow, we could put like 30 people in here. It's like, this is, we're a low income thing, sort of crowded individual rooms and stuff, but we're privileged compared to that. You know, you may be privileged compared to ours, but it's like, that's all pecking order and that's the kind of challenges, you know, to be able to have, to make space for other people. Uh, and how do you do that? How do you step outside of your habitual privilege and downshift into people supporting each other. Yeah, you know, the, the classic way that co-housing communities form is you build the community first, the people first. You have a strong group of people that care about living together intentionally. And then you plan the actual buildings. And while, while we were building PDX Commons, uh, we, we kept going with um, this is not your ideal home this is your ideal community like the the relationships between the people are more important than the brick and mortar that's there and we couldn't get everything that we wanted we had to compromise a lot because we make decisions on a consensus model so everybody doesn't always get everything they want but what you end up generally is what it what benefits the most people rather than what you know, one loud person thinks is the most important thing. Can you rephrase in one sentence sort of the point that you're hoping us to focus on right now? Gapping what's the relationship between the infrastructure Yeah, what's the relationship between social and built infrastructure in terms of evolving the group in a more green, resilient, uh, secure direction, you know, given the instability, you know, that we're sort of in the early going, but, but there's a reason for doing this stuff, you know, for a lot of people, it's mutual assistance. You know, it might only be pertinent in our particular co-op out of the ones we're talking about right now, where we have standing committees that have budgets they have the power to actually take action and deal with that refrigerator that needs to be fixed or replaced. But is that model perhaps useful on a neighborhood level or a city level? Personally, I'm still into electoral politics where you've got people who create a vision, think of the future that they want for their children, and um, think about where Z is and where R is and A, and you know they've got a kind of pretty good plan. And then you start running a bunch of women and maybe some men for office and you win and you do the policies and that's the kind of stuff that should be happening right now so that the next election that comes up in any department you've got people who are thinking permaculture sustainability Bambi being all right and you've got those people in office and that helps and but and just on the neighborhood level our co-op really ought to be encouraging other people to do what we've done to, to just do it, get a bunch of people together somehow. There's a, lots of models, you can use capitalism, you can band together your cash and buy some property and set up, like the Emerald uh, Tiny Village is a total outgrowth using our structure. Now that tiny village place is used, you know, using what we use to get organized. So a lot of it's just talking to each other and like, how do you all do your meetings? What works better? and share those skills. We need to learn how to make fires from scratch. You know, we're getting back to that point. 
the social uh, problem is, is difficult for me to talk about because I'm the landlord at, at our place. I, I bought the property in 91 strictly as a real estate investment and then I discovered green building and kind of glommed onto it and this whole place grew and I, I, I feel weird about being a landlord having that kind of a power dynamic and I, I, I do feel that one day uh, there will come a time when there will be so much disruption in the economy and the banking system that I'll simply stop paying the mortgages because there will be no one there to receive them and then, and then, and then I'll just tell people, you know, stop paying rent, we're done with that. Um, uh, and also, I, I have it in my will that when I go, uh, one third will go to my wife, one third to my nephew, who's the closest thing I have to a son, and then, and then one third to the community if, if they can. And, and I expect when they, if they, if I, if I get diagnosed with cancer, they start working overtime to, to, to build the kind of a, a, a structure that would be there to receive that, that endowment. So, yeah. And you know, I, 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 people are going to have to start thinking differently. That's you know, I come, I, I've done activism up, down, and sideways every which way, and, and people have to start thinking differently in, in terms of conflict resolution, in terms of politics. I hate to see you have someone get elected to public office and then they're faced 24/7 with this incentive to compromise their ideals and start to change their way of viewing things and. And, and that was why I, I, I wanted to build a meditation sanctuary. I'm, I'm convinced that it's, it's not a, a trite, new agey thing that human consciousness must change. It is simply the, the, the case that people have to start thinking about that. I, I like the expression, an enhanced faculty of discernment, so that people will believe what's true as distinct from believing whatever happens to be convenient for them, which is what a lot of politicians do, corporate executives and the like. It's really hard to let go of comfort, habit, privilege, uh, and I can feel that in our in our co-op. Even though we're you know way down the ladder of privilege in the society individually, uh, it's just it it takes a letting go and a turning around that is just really hard to do for anybody. And I have a feeling that. It's not so much people are going to gather around and make all these co-ops and stuff. It's that things will fall apart. Your privilege will be taken away from you. Our privilege is going to be removed. The ability to be comfortable and have what we want won't be there. And people are going to be desperately trying to figure out some way to make it, kind of, at whatever new level they're living at. Uh, and then we might have something to suggest, but we'll be in the same, same circumstance, you know. Uh, I don't know what our co-op would be like if the kind of situation you were describing existed, which I expect to happen, you know, in various ways. But I don't know who we would be like because we, our house is made largely of people who are doing their own thing. I'm one of them to spend a lot of time in my office and, you know, on the computer doing the thing that is important to me. Uh, and what happens if the internet goes down totally? You know, all my electronic creations are gone. You know. How do I relate and what do we do with our garden? You know, say, like, can you feed yourself in the garden? Well, not like that. You have to maintain it. You know, whatever. It's a whole different world. So I, the question you ask is, <laughs> is such a challenge to have any sensible way to, uh, to provide information for people who are really, really looking for that kind of guidance. It's like, let's get together when it happens and talk and see what we can come up with is sort of where I go. Try to learn something, you know, like what what your experience is that I know I don't have that experience and maybe some other people do here or maybe they don't but um, the whole idea of reducing eco footprints because Skeeter and I have talked a lot about this I'm sure I don't know about your place because it's a it's maybe a more upscale model but this is all you know fairly low income and um, the, the capacity of collaboration and cooperation instead of everybody having their own thing, you know, is, is just going to become more common because people are going to be less able to afford their own stuff. So you guys got any, any sort of question of each other? Why don't you just sort of talk with each other a little bit? If you got, you know, want to follow up on something. I have a further comment I want to share. 
uh, one of the most interesting eye-opening experiences I had recently was uh, a friend of mine spent three years in the Peace Corps in Senegal, literally living in a, a, an African village with huts and circles, like literally. And, uh, and she said that people there did not want community. They would try to build fences to separate themselves <laughs> wherever possible from their neighbors, and whenever anybody came into some money, boom, they were gone. They'd head for their, their version of the suburbs or whatever. So uh, I think really community has existed not throughout history, uh, not because it's been desirable, but out of sheer necessity. And I think that's what we'll be seeing. Uh, community is, we're, we're like doing this little test plots of community as a, as a matter of principle because we think it's a good idea. But over time, again, it's going to be like a, a model that other people will suddenly want to emulate very badly. <coughs> yeah. And lots of experiments. We just happen to be for experiments here. But there will be a lot more experiments in oh, the future yeah. and more different varieties of showing up out of the necessity. I'm curious if you all do any networking per se with other groups to find out how they do their pet policy or how they uh, have conflict resolution, you know, how they accept new members. We actually use a lottery system now at the co-op. As it turns out, we're having Walnut Street Co-op over to our house for dinner tomorrow night. Oh, that's cool. Cool. We have, there are occasional social connections, but not mutu organized mutual learning kinds of things. Or information exchanges that can happen a bit on the informal, but we a number of times we connected up with other co-ops, but it's to hang out and talk, get to know each other, sort of feel the larger community around us. I don't go online, but does anybody know whether or not like there is a quote site where people go to this sort of a a clearinghouse for cooperatives, low income, and whatever? There there may be something like that. So on that the people can get skills pulled out. And Yes, Eugene Conscious, yeah. cool. Eugene Conscious Community. Some of Write it up on the, on the blackboard. Some of our members yeah. could do that. I There's also the foundation for intentional community uh -huh. is like a global network uh -huh. of yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, alternative yeah, yeah. community, which you're not a member of. So I guess you can <laughs> Google it and get all yeah. kinds of yeah. sites. And so let me, let me just mention that we're going to visit a couple of these locations on these site tours that I, that I mentioned. We'll visit East Blair and we'll vi visit Maitreya Eco Village. And uh, in, in both of these, we're not, we're not doing Walnut. We have a guy that but maybe together, we can but add that possible. if you want. Yeah, yeah. We can add that. This is real interesting. And, and get a little bit more into uh, whatever topics and actually see what these places look like. You know, it's, it's way interesting. And people are welcome to walk on over to talk to say Skeeter said it was okay and just <laughs> stroll around. Yeah, we're near the southwest corner of Fourth and Adams, actually southeast too. Cohousing.org. Yeah, so cohousing has a national um, organization Adams. and they they have an annual conference and it was in Portland this year. Uh, also in the Portland area, there is a group that's called PDX Plus that is um, a bunch of the local co-housing communities. They get together monthly and they compare notes about all kinds of you know policies and how do you do meals. That sounds like you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, but there's a there's like a bulletin board that I get um, email messages about.